Um, so um, I'm going to provide a little bit of history, and Rodney's going to talk about some contemporary problems with um, something called the Income Security Program for Cree hunters, fishers, and trappers. And this is a, a program that was part of, it was one of the benefits negotiated under the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement uh, in 1975. This was um, the first comprehensive claims settlement uh, in, uh, um, uh, in Canada. <clears throat> it's effectively the first uh, treaty uh, to be negotiated in Canada since the 1920s. Uh, under very different uh, circumstances uh, from the, those that were negotiated in the, uh, particularly the um, uh, 19th and early 20th centuries, which were uh, uh, treaties of so-called cession and surrender, of extinguishment. Uh, and the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement purported to do that, but at the same time uh, was uh, from the Cree's perspective, a treaty which uh, nailed down in tremendous detail uh, the obligations of, of the Quebec and Canadian governments. Um, okay, thank you, Nafisa. I don't know how you solved that, but that's, that's uh, we can start there. Um, <clears throat> so when I mentioned the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement, here's a, a map of uh, uh, treaties in Canada. Uh, this is the area that was covered by the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement, and uh, the, the Crees of EUSC occupy and inhabit uh, a traditional territory in about the southern 40% of, uh, of that larger area, with Inuit to the north and uh, in, a, in an attached agreement uh, uh, Naskapi uh, Inu uh, to the east. Um, so, some of the background of this was that when the when the, the, the agreement was triggered by a massive hydroelectric project that the Crees opposed until their legal options were essentially exhausted, but they did generate enough uh, leverage through that process uh, to undertake these negotiations. Um, I'm just gonna focus on livelihoods and, and, uh, and, and the role of the income security program uh, today in this. Um, in the 1920s, when my grandparents were farmers, um, the people of the same generation in, in the James Bay Cree territory were making as much money trapping commercially as my grandparents were making farming. Um, and that in the 1920s was about $1,000 a year. But in, by some measures you could say that the Crees were more affluent because they were harvesting a tremendous amount of food and producing a lot of other uh, uh, products. Uh, from the land. So money was abundant and adequate to their needs and they were continuing to uh, provision themselves uh, very largely from the land. By the 1970s things had changed dramatically. Uh, <clears throat> in the 1970s a, a, a hunting family with a good territory would be fortunate to uh, be able to harvest $2,000 to $3,000. In 1970 dollars, that was a lot less than, th than they were earning in the 1920s and a lot less than any farmer or rancher would require uh, uh, in that decade. Things have only gotten worse since. Uh, in, the, in the 1970s, uh, a large beaver pelt uh, uh, was worth $60. In more recent years, it's been worth something in the neighborhood of uh, $18 to $25. And beaver were the staple uh, animal for uh, Crees in, in uh, much of this territory. Fish uh, in the summer are also very important, but uh, for winter hunting, uh, 
I've included this slide because that animal is emblematic of the, of the way that, f that food and commercial production uh, have been fused for Crees since the 1600s. Uh, certainly by the time the Hudson Bay Company set up operations in 1670 uh, on that coast, uh, Crees were already uh, well engaged with uh, uh, obtaining a number of material uh, technologies uh, from, uh, from trading networks. Uh, they were doing so uh, then uh, as now from on the basis of uh, family hunting territories. This is a depiction of a customary system of, of family territory. Um, the income security program uh, came at a time when Cree hunters had become dependent on the welfare system. Uh, the uh, federal government, uh, and then uh, in cooperation with the Quebec government, uh, uh, more recently prior to the uh, James Bay Agreement, were providing about half of uh, normal annual benefits, welfare benefits, to Cree hunting families, recognizing that that was a good deal because the, that half was enough uh, for people to go to the bush and to combine with their fur income and to still make a viable livelihood. Uh, but that was getting too meager uh, for many families. Uh, uh, air charter had become the way for people to get into their bush camps, uh, often up to three, four hundred kilometers from, uh, from the nearest village. They would go to those camps, they'd stay there for eight months, from fall to spring, uh, typically. Um, and air charter was expensive. People were uh, beginning to use more snowmobiles, uh, gasoline in the 1970s. Gasoline prices spiked. The Crees were getting squeezed out of, of hunting as a primary occupation. On average, two out of three years and people started to adopt the strategy of staying in the village, trying to get seasonal employment uh, and generate enough cash to get back to the bush for uh, those other two out of three years. And it became a part of their way of managing as well, their, their, their territories in, in the, as populations rose. So when they negotiated the income security program, uh, it, it felt like it was, a, 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 again, a return of affluence. Uh, because it was enough money for the average hunting family to go to the bush for eight, even ten months of the year. They were getting a uh, daily allowance as well as a basic uh, uh, payment uh, per family. Um, and we went from, uh, thank you, we went from uh, a situation where uh, perhaps less, something less than half of the Cree population, of the adult population, was in the bush every year, to uh, back to something over two-thirds. So it was a very successful program in the early years. Um, and in some ways continues to be a very successful and, and popular program, but for reasons that Rodney will speak to, uh, has, has come into uh, some new difficulties. Uh, for one thing, since the 1970s, the population has more than tripled. And so even though the enrollment in the program has held fairly steady in, ab in absolute numbers, uh, the, uh, the demographics of the, of the economy as a whole have changed dramatically. And, and now people who live as occupational hunters are a, are, are a fairly small minority, probably something in the order of about a fifth and they tend to be older folks like myself who are moving out of the wage economy and retiring to do what they really love, which is to be in the bush. Uh, so we're seeing fewer and fewer young people in, uh, in occupational hunting, and that has become a major concern in terms of, of, of uh, livelihood continuity and the, the, the tremendous importance still of food in this economy, of food from the land. Uh, in the 1970s, 80 to 90 percent uh, of the food that people consumed was from the land. 
uh, from hunting, fishing, and trapping primarily, also berry gathering and a few other uh, activities, but chiefly uh, faunal resources. Uh, at that time, over 50% of the total economy, if you, if you valued country food at some reasonable replacement rate, 50% of that economy uh, was, uh, was, was still hunting. That's a much smaller uh, ratio today. I couldn't put exact numbers on it. Uh, so that's the, um, the kind of background, and um, um, I will uh, turn it over to Rodney. Do I have two minutes, or? Just before I start, I went to New Zealand, and I got a Maori tattoo, so. I, I wanted to show it to you, and it just felt... Uh, You don't know how far it goes. <laughs> I have I have one on my other shoulder too. So. In Oakland? Where'd you get them? Oakland. Hamilton. Hamilton. I got it in Hamilton by a Marie tattoo artist. <laughs> yeah. So, those of you planning on going to uh, New Zealand, I know place. <laughs> I think one of the the thing what the, the thing was Colin was saying about. The country, I mean, country food or traditional food. Uh, <clears throat> as the increase of store-bought food was increasing, and uh, and as the wild game consumption was decreasing, the increase in um, uh, diabetes and obesity is almost parallel. So I just thought I'd make a note of that. Uh, <clears throat> The reason I'm wearing my hat, it's Jimmy Boston. Uh, he's my uncle uh, who passed away recently. And um, basically, he lived in, in the construction industry. And he basically said, I work to go hunting. Uh, in recent years, in his, you know, in his late 50s, he started trying to live off the land with the income security program. And he was struggling a lot in terms of uh, gas, in terms of skidoo, in terms of uh, ammunition, in terms of just just those basic items to really live off the land. So uh, there is a very, I mean, to buy a skidoo in the 70s must have been 2000 maybe. <laughs> but now, you know, uh, the cheapest one you can find is probably in the range of, you know, $9,000 or 6000 So it's been a huge challenge. Uh, I, for him to live off the live off the land, and I think one of the <clears throat> one of the biggest things of it is there is a lot of subsidy programs that are trying to be implemented within the income security pro program for people that are living off the living off the land on a full time basis. Uh, the fur industry is not very good, so it's really hurt uh, a lot of the supplement income for for our population. There is um, a plan to re-appeal or rebrand hunting in a more prestigious way. I think that's the plan that we're all trying to do within the Cree Nation government. I think that's something we want to do. We want to make it more attractive because it's associated, it's become like in the 70s and even in the 80s, you know, growing up, identifying your dad as a hunter trapper was prestigious. Today, it's almost, nobody breaks about it, let's just say. It's really gone the, the other direction. So I, I think that's something we're <clears throat> cognizant of to try to rebrand it in a, a, as, a, as a prestigious uh, vocation. I think one of the other things that we're trying to do is we want to integrate, uh, <clears throat> we talked about food security and food sovereignty. I think one of the things that we want to do is re reintroduce uh, community garden harvesting in the territory to really increase uh, wild game food and also the, 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 uh, the blueberries and the berries that we eat. Because um, I think one of the issues is poverty. Right now what we're doing right, right now is we're trying to integrate 
They have a program, which is a Cree Trappers Association. What we're trying to do, oh, I got five minutes? I'm almost done. <laughs> I can show you my other tattoo. <laughs> uh, I think one of the things that we're trying to do is we're doing an after school program. We're doing a, a stay in school program for, for, for the high school students because of our high school graduation rate. Our high school graduation rate is at 40%. Uh, our goal by within five years is to make it 80%. And one of the mechanisms that we're gonna to try to integrate is a trapper's, a trapper's training program within it. And I think to engage kids to, to go into the land. So I think that's one of the things that we wanna integrate. Uh, no, I lost my thought here. Uh, and also, I think one of the biggest challenges with people that are living in, 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 on the income security program who are trappers, who are hunters, is the isolation. They're not as engaged in the community as they, as they were in the 70s and in the 80s. So I think one of the things that we want to do is we want to introduce a community project where they, they do participate in the community to engage them in the community, but also harvesting activities picking up uh, Labrador tea or blueberries or some fishing for the community. So the idea is to re-engage them. I mean, <clears throat> the goal basically is to empower people and engage people into the development in terms of community development and economic development or just uh, sustainable uh, practice. So I think I'll leave it at that. Okay.